What could be a better way to bring our conference to a close this year than an interview with IU President Michael McRobbie? So, Michael, if you'll come and join us. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> So many of the audience uh, worked in UCS and BACS and other organizations before UITS was even created. So for those of you who recall those days, you may remember that uh, I believe it was on September 11th of 1996 when uh, the news broke that this guy was coming from Australia to... Uh, take over this new role as vice president for I IT and uh, chief information officer. So Michael, if we, we just do a little retro backup uh, and say, what in the world caused you to leave uh, the glorious Australian National University there in beautiful Canberra to pick up and move to Hoosier land and uh, begin the next chapter of your career? Well, you made it sound so attractive, Brad. <laughs> I, I, I'm starting to wonder. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'd, uh, I, I'd actually, I've been at, I did my PhD at ANU, and I, I'd uh, been there for, I think, 13 years when I moved here and had worked in a variety of different positions and been very active uh, nationally and internationally for that matter. Um, had, uh, from the outset, developed a lot of relationships with people um, in the US and elsewhere in the world and was here well, quite often three or four times a year for various things, meetings, conferences and so on. And I, I really admired uh, uh, the, the best centres of um, research and IT in the US and they were just on a scale beyond what um, people were capable of doing in a country that's only got a 20th of the population and um, oh, 15th of the population. And, and so uh, uh, I decided that, uh, in terms of my own career, I was actually just interested in, in, in doing something larger and more substantial where I could maintain my research interests. Um, and uh, this opportunity uh, presented itself. I, I uh, was sort of recruited and three people nominated me, um, one of which was Mike Dunn. Uh, I don't know whether Mike's here or not. Uh, another is the late John Barwise, a very, very great stand, uh, uh, scientist who came to IU from Stanford. And the other was Dennis Gannon, of course, who was head of CS for a long time and was a great uh, partner in numerous enterprises, as was Mike, as was John. And uh, so they all nominated me and I got interviewed by Miles and I, I'd been here before uh, quite a few times and Miles and I hit it off and so I accepted the position. That was basically the, the story, nothing particularly more than that, Brad. <laughs> Well, and who would have known that that was the beginning of one of IU's presidents, the day that you arrived? Certainly not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, we, we have the uh, nostalgia picture here from the, the news release. We've seen that you found a razor since, uh, uh, si since those days. I hadn't, I hadn't shaved that day, actually. That was the trouble <laughs> that was taken. So, so tell us a little bit, Michael. Uh, you began, officially began the appointment in January of 97, as I recall. And uh, at that time, the campuses had separate IT units, separate phone companies. Uh, this conference predated that by a couple of years. There had been a couple of, hey, Bloomington and IU, maybe we ought to talk to each other just a little bit about tech stuff. But when you walked in that first year, what were some of the impressions that you remember as you came to IU and the, the IT organizations? Well, I, I, I was moderately f familiar with the university at that stage, ha having visited here, I can't remember, five or six times before before I moved here, including obviously two phases of the interview process, and had spent a fair bit of time studying uh, the institution and, and so on. And I, I, I had the view, and I'm sure people who were around at the time who were uh, senior people, I saw Norma over here before and others, um, and I, 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 would ha I had this discussion, and that is that Firstly, um, IT at, at IU struck me as um, very much an underperforming operation. And by underperforming, I don't mean the effort by the people. 
I just mean in terms of how it was being utilised by the university, and that was no fault of any of the people in information technology organisation. It was a failure on the part of the university to take um, full advantage of um, just an outstanding set of professionals. I mean, I, th I regard it as one of the things that is uh, the greatest about um, having served for the period I did as uh, VP for IT, that so many of those senior people are still here and still contributing, and uh, that the the attrition has been, I think, so um, so relatively low. And uh, I I I saw that that uh, that I thought there was the opportunity to really present the case for information technology at the highest level in the institution um, through the president's cabinet, which is what I proceeded to do but also to, to leverage it in ways that it hadn't been leveraged before in support of the research and education mission of the institution and then also to start engaging in, in significant ways beyond where we had already engaged um, uh, uh, nationally and, and as, as of course it later transpired internationally as well. Uh, I uh, had heard that there was a, a E, uh, ERC, uh, Efficiency mm -hmm. Review Committee, Expenditure Review Committee, put in place when you came in uh, about February of 97, saying, let's take a look at this, let's see where our money's going, how well perf mm -hmm. we're performing, for what do we get. And this report is legendary. I've heard this referred to. It was uh, led by uh, Laurie Antolovich, as I remember. I had never seen this report until just a few years ago. And in our move out of Franklin Hall over to the Cyber Infrastructure Builder building, somewhere it got unearthed. And uh, it was really an interesting uh, report. And what it said was, if we would put these organizations together and really manage it with leverage and some scale, uh, we could redeploy two and a half million dollars a year in savings and put it back into the academic mission. It's like really getting a recurring two and a half million dollar a year grant if you just became a bit more efficient uh, in doing it. Now what I think was interesting about that time, so when Michael goes to put together uh, University Information Technology Services, and it was August of 97, if I have the facts right, this was before I was in, involved end, with end it. End of August, yeah. Yeah. Um, th we need to take a moment to understand how countercultural that was at the moment. In the 90s, things were decentralizing. Client server, PCs, empowering the users, you know, down with the mainframe, down with the central IT organizations, and all of a sudden, here comes this guy from out of town and says, you know, maybe we need to pull stuff together a bit more in an organization with leverage. So what was it like making the case for that in the 90s, kind of against the trends of the day? Well, I, I think the key thing was, and, and again, I, I pay... Um, all credit to, to the senior leadership of, the, uh, of, of information technology at IU at the time, I think, who saw all this clearly. Um, that, that, I mean, I'd, I'd been in uh, uh, supercomputing and parallel computing for a long time, uh, and they'd been driven out of a much more theoretical research interests that, I, that I'd had, and uh, had, had um, been involved in building up a, what people used to call a zoo of parallel computers. <laughs> and and this this was seen as a, being an extremely exciting time in high performance computing because the sky was the limit with respect to architectures and processor types and uh, people were looking at one bit processors. The Connection Machine Two was um, probably the most beautiful computer ever built. By the way, uh, was um, uh, had become all the rage briefly and so on. And and th there was this um, uh, there was a real ferment of of interest in computational styles and, and so on. Uh, and I'd been in that area for, I don't know, 10 years or something, but, but and it was, and what, it was NDA'd by everybody who could NDA you in the area, so I had some real sense of where everything was, was going. And, uh, and it just seemed absolutely clear, and plenty of people were saying it, this was not brilliant, it, absolutely clear that the world was becoming commoditized and standardized, and, and that the arguments for maintaining balkanized IT, which were really based on, you know, we use this operating system and we use this particular uh, uh, hardware and, and these applications and we have to be separate for those, for those reasons, 
were, were just going to fall by the wayside. I mean, they would have been completely eroded. And then on top of that, you could also see it hadn't happened at the time. It's happened now. Um, the conversion, uh, the, the um, convergence of, of um, uh, uh, sort of internet based communications and telephonic communications, all that was clearly on the way as well. Um, so it, it just seemed to me that the way to go in the future, oh, sorry, the other thing I was going to mention too, of course, is you were seeing operating systems. I mean, those of you who were around in those days remember what a plethora of operating systems there, there were, but you could see it was really starting to converge on just you know, Unix and, um, and, and Windows, or it became Windows, uh, and, uh, and the Mac OS, and then of course when they picked up um, Unix, you really had, in a sense, two. Uh, and, and there were multiple uh, communications protocols, I'm sure as people will remember, but again, it seemed that everything was just converging on TCP IP. Um, uh, and again, that was going to be another powerful argument for, for not balkanizing how IT was run. So, so what I argued was just that, that standards, um, commoditization, were just going to drive information technology to be a sort of homogenous whole, and that the arguments for being special really had no validity as they still have no validity, in my view. Um, and, th and that was the fundamental underlying philosophy of, of the, uh, the reorganization to form, to form UITS. So one of the really early big deals that endures to this day was IU cutting the enterprise deal with Microsoft. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what it took to put that together internally and then to get the deal done with Microsoft? Well, um, th there are all kinds of people who deserve enormous credit for this. Laurie, Laurie Antolovich played a major role um, in, in the financial modeling of that. Uh, Brian Voss was the guy who went out and convinced deans that they, they, should, uh, they should do this, and there were others, I'm sure I'm missing people unfairly here, who contributed uh, to that. But, that. but that, again, was, was just um, an instance of the point I was, I was just making. Uh, the, the, the institution, parts of the institution, different campuses, different schools, are all trying to do um, different deals with the same company for the same stuff. And something was wrong with this picture. Yeah. And, and the obvious thing to do was to aggregate it all into one deal. Now today, this is just mother's milk. I mean, this is, I mean, it, everybody understands this and does it, and there's rarely any opposition to doing things at an enterprise-wide level in just about any area. But then it was kind of revolutionary. But you know, again, I have to pay great tribute to one of my predecessors in my present job, uh, Miles Brand. Miles was a uh, was a fabulous president, uh, much under underappreciated, and uh, um, I've never worked for anybody better, as I said, at his um, memorial service. And um, uh, I took the idea to Miles, and he instantly got it. Yes, of course, right, do it, sure. If I go, you know, <laughs> well, we'll get this done, Miles. You know, so, <laughs> and we did, and. Uh, I still remember, and I'm sure Laurie remembers, um, I think one of the key parts of this was, um, was actually getting the School of Medicine to come along with this, and, and as, it, as it was with the, with the, um, the desktop replacement initiative that came a couple of years later. Uh, uh, and people never, I mean, I remember talking to other CIOs, and they'd say, oh, you'll never get medicine, but we did. And, uh, and medicine, I think, um, uh, has, um, incrementally become sort of a better and better player and partner in these kinds of initiatives too. Well, I, I think that was hugely influential, uh, getting that deal done at enterprise scale. And uh, for me, I was a business school professor, uh, an untenured assistant professor at the Kelly School. And in the uh, summer of 1999, as I recall, it might have been the summer of 1998, I remember getting this general email that went out to faculty about this uh, uh, IT strategic plan thing, and you know, for faculty, you're like, uh, whatever, uh, you're not paying any attention to it. And uh, but this particular invite said they were serving breakfast if you wanted to come to the meeting. <laughs> so uh, when I got back from Finland, I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to go hear about this thing because I did uh, in the Kelly School, I did information systems and tech, and and uh, so I showed up at this breakfast here in uh, the Frangipani room down down the the, the way here and. Uh, then Vice President McRobbie walked in and proceeded to enlighten us and tell us about 
the strategic plan and there were many illustrations of uh, battles and war and people who won had leverage and had the high ground and I remember all the, the military uh, metaphors uh, to it and I thought well you know this sounds uh, generally good but truly the, the one thing I really remember from that morning talk was the point of leverage was bringing the whole of the university to bear on these trends that were happening in technology commoditization standardization greater pervasiveness across the enterprise it wasn't just the statisticians who were using technology all of a sudden the humanists were needing it and this was just uh, going on and so uh, this IT strategic plan turned out to be the 1998 version uh, I, I think it just changed everything around here Michael, can you talk a little bit about the plan and implementing it? And, and in particular, I, I think writing a plan is one thing. Pulling it off and executing it is entirely another matter. So can you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Um, I, I do, I'm remiss in the, if, just one minute, uh, since we're talking in private. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I had to tell the story, if people will forgive me. Uh, the, the Microsoft deal was a big deal for us cause it, because it got us on, it really got us on people's radar screens around the, around the country and I think was the first of a whole range of things that, that we did and so many people in this room are responsible for that um, took us to the position of leadership which I think we still have today and, uh, and have just accentuated and under Brad's leadership and under the leadership of many people here and with the hard work of everybody here but um, Michigan had um, I think had regarded itself as being the leader in uh, university information technology up to that stage, um, a position which I think they no longer hold. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but my wife Laurie was then working for the Michigan IT organization <laughs> and when the Microsoft announcement was, um, came out, she said that, that she had the paper and she said, who's this McGrovey guy? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a kind of nice portent of the future. Um, with respect to the uh, strategic plan, uh, that was, uh, the critical thing there was having a committee of credible people. Um, who are faculty, credible faculty, who could, and, and, and administrators, but to me the, the, it was the faculty who were key to it. And um, the three people I mentioned before, all of them were heavily involved in it. John Barwise wrote big chunks of the section on teaching and learning. Uh, Dennis wrote big chunks of the section on re research computing. Mike contributed uh, uh, to both. Um, the late Jerry Birnbaum, uh, helped uh, enormously with the drafting on it. I wrote a lot of it myself. Uh, but, but the critical thing was getting it endorsed by that committee of highly respected, distinguished um, faculty and senior administrators in the university. And then getting, um, and then getting Miles' uh, backing for it. Now, I remember taking it to Miles and he said, this is great, after he'd read it. And he said, but now you need to take it uh, out and sell it. And I think between myself and others like um, uh, Brian and um, I think Jacob Levinan and Norma and others, uh, we probably gave 200 different presentations over the next three or four months around the, around the university and finally took it to the board in the uh, December meeting of the board that year and got it, got it formally approved. So it had been developed through a highly um, credible process uh, and a highly inclusive process right across the university, all campuses. It, it was developed in a way that gave a, that gave a sort of a significant and equal role to both of the major campuses, but was um, inclusive of the regional campuses as well. And um, uh, had as the, the people who um, had had uh, pulled it together uh, some of the um, some of the most credible people in information technology in the in the university. So it was very hard for people to, to um, gain say anything that was, that was in that report. Now, the other thing that was going on at the same time, and this is maybe less than known, and, but, I, but I think just as important was, uh, firstly, there were funds available. Funds had been reserved in, um, in uh, what was then UITS. Uh, uh, Miles had got 
funds from the state uh, for a general upgrade and refresh of IT that he had not released. Um, and he said that once there was a plan, he would release them. And there were some other sources of funding as well. Laurie and her staff behind the scenes um, uh, put, in, put in place, and, and this document, I don't know whether you've got this document, it's about that thick, uh, which was a, just a tour de force, and it took every one of the actions, and then it took the campuses, and it kind of broke down exactly what the nature of the investment would, would be. Uh, and then came out with a costing, there was a high number and a low number and so on. That was something that I also took to Miles. That was, a, that was um, approved at, uh, uh, at a, I think the figure was about 210 million from memory, over a five year period. Uh, and that became the critical driver, that there, that there, that there was serious resources behind this plan. Um, too often, in fact more often than not, strategic plans uh, get developed and printed and they look terrific and then they just gather dust on the credenza, credenza wear as people, people call them. Um, but we were determined to make this one work and the way to make it work is to put resources behind it. It's like we're doing with the university strategic plan at, at the moment, as you've seen, we're putting very significant resources behind that plan as well. Um, and, and a combination of, I think, reading the technology marketplace right, um, enormous energy from all the people who were involved in implementing it, basically goodwill across most of the most of the university, the support of the president, the then president, and so on. I think was what was responsible for making the success. And you go and look at that plan. I was always immensely proud of that. After five years, pretty much everything in there had been implemented, if not in full, and certainly um, in significant part. And that continues to be the, the case today with the, the plan that you're working under, I think, which is coming up to pretty much to conclusion now, but under that plan as well. And, and I think we can't uh, emphasize enough how important and transformative that time period was enabling us to be where we are today. So when I showed up in January of 2002 for a part-time role doing what is principally Stacy's job now, the first thing you learn is no one works for Michael part-time, despite what your letter says, uh, given, your, <laughs> given your other job. And uh, the second thing was walking around as a business school guy, uh, you know, I didn't know much about campus administration or, you know, the, the Cali School in those days was like, you know, never cross 10th Street. You know, we were pretty much an island uh, uh, unto ourselves. But I got over in, uh, in the vice president's office and with many of the colleagues that Michael has mentioned, You'd walk up and down the hallways and people would go, yeah, 32 is a little behind, but I think we're good on 28, and there'd be 71. And, and they were just talking these numbers as if they made sense. But these were the action item numbers from the IT strategic plan. And every one of those action items was tied to an implementation plan, and every one of those was tied to a multi-year budget uh, connected to it. Now, if I recall, there were 68 action items. There were 10 recommendations, 68 action items. If you pick the plan up today, and we, we learned some things along the way. There are a few things we didn't quite have figured out exactly right about the future of distance education and all. But probably a solid 60 of those 68 action items were pretty right and, and really got implemented. And if you pick that plan up today and read the 10 major recommendations, they are as timeless today as they were when they were written. Recommendation number one, quit replacing PCs out of year-end salary savings. You know, these things are going to get old. Budget for them, put them on a life cycle replacement program, you know, network gear when it gets old. And this plan really laid the fiscal uh, uh, governance, the political, the technological aspirations that set this organization on the journey that we're on now. So maybe, Michael, for the, the next question, I'd be curious if you would have ever envisioned from those days that now UITS would be a thousand uh, professional staff strong, about 600 part-time staff, plus hundreds and hundreds more in the schools and administrative departments, all tied together into an organization like this. Uh, was that foreseeable in that day? Well, um, I mean, in a sense, yes, because uh, I think it was just abundantly clear. I mean, I've given multiple speeches on this in other contexts, but 
but it was abundantly clear that, um, that the use of information technology was becoming utterly pervasive across all the disciplines. Um, it, it didn't matter what area you were in. I mean, we've, there's been some superb work done in, in classics that uh, Bernie Frischer um, has, um, has done, and uh, obviously the, the work in, in the digital preservation of music um, was uh, probably the best of its kind at the, at the time, and I'm sure still is world leading. Um, and so it goes on. There's hardly an area that, that of, of academia um, that you can choose that, doesn't, uh, that isn't influenced to a greater or lesser degree by IT. And then on top of that, the, the actual the environment for the, for the scholarly research, intellectual debates, um, all take place within uh, an IT environment. I remember when I started out first doing research as a graduate student, I mean, you'd get a result and you'd have to type it up laboriously with changing golf balls on typewriters, for those of you who remember that, um, <laughs> and uh, then copying it and sending overseas, and you might get comments on it back in six weeks or something like that. I mean, now that's done instantly. Uh, and and, the, and, and it, it, you can't do science unless you're working at that speed and within that, uh, or research of any kind, or scholarship of any kind, unless you're working within that kind of um, uh, I environment. And again, you know, one could foresee all this. You just, you look at the best places and the best people and, and then you just extrapolate it from that. And, and then, so clearly, be, the universities that really were going to be the great universities uh, of the future were going to be those um, that, that most comprehensively integrated information technology into what they, and what they did and supported it uh, appropriately within the institution and gave it the right level of um, uh, visibility and understanding within the, within the administrative structure of the university, all of which I'd like to think we've done right now for 19, 19 years here too. Um, so in that sense, uh, the fact that um, the, the, the UITS has, has continued to prosper and, and um, what have you under your great leadership, Brad, I think is, um, is, is almost a natural outgrowth of endeavouring to be the best um, institution because we have to do this to be the best institution. Well, I, th I think that's right. And one of the things that I see, and you look at the 20-year arc of this conference and the 18 years uh, since UITS was created and, and working with schools and departments, is the increased professionalization of the role of our IT staff and, and professionals. Because it is, as Michael mentions, it's just pervasive in all lines of our research, uh, uh, you know, whether it's performance anymore, uh, I, we had a, a harpist play at an event the other night, and she sat down, she set up her beautiful harp, and she set up her iPad. And the music was on the iPad as, as she was uh, playing along. But increasingly, uh, our, our, our whole enterprise of education and research, deeply supported by technology and the many professionals here who enable it. So now if we turn a little bit to the future, Michael, I've heard you make some remarks recently and say sometimes uh, if you read the popular press and the newspaper, you would think that universities have not changed or done anything uh, at all in recent years. And you kind of gone through a litany of things that have been happening around here, particularly following new academic directions. Um, how about a summary of that for this group, particularly on the academic front with new schools and such that have been developed? Well, yes, I, I, um, nothing sort of outrages me more than to, than to read those claims about uh, academia not being able to, to, to change and to change kind of rapidly in response to, to what needs to be done. But um, we, we have, um, over the last uh, eight years, uh, firstly over the last four years, we have uh, created seven new schools at the, at the university. Um, the two public health schools, the new School of Global and International, International Studies, for which the Secretary of State was here last week as part of the opening of, of that, the, uh, the merger of SLIS with informatics to form the new School of Informatics and Computing, of which you're about to be the interim dean uh, for a period as well, and there's everything else you have on your plate. Uh, uh, the, the, school of, um, the School of Philanthropy, 
the media school and the new school of um, art and design on on this campus. Uh, and the closing of the school of continuing and the closing studies. Of the, well, the, I think of it as being more the the um, uh, the evolution of evolution. that in, into the uh, the the IU online program uh, too, because it no longer needed a school, but it needed a program. So that's the way I think about that. Um, I mean, that's that that is as many schools as were established uh, about a century ago under William O'Brien when he, when he really did take the university from being two schools, the college and the, what, what is now the Mao School, and then turned it into a great research university. So that's more change than we've ever seen before. We've done nearly $2, uh, sorry, $2 billion in construction around the institution. That's what makes it so hard to get around the campuses. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's more to come. Uh, a lot of that is dealing with deferred problems. Uh, when I, I remember in my inauguration address, I said that um, we had not touched any, any renovation of any of the student dormitories on this campus uh, since 1969. Well, that, we're now halfway through the process of renovating all of them, which we intend to get done by the bicentenary. Um, we're building major new dormitories at, or student residences at, um, IEPUI, I'm pretty certain that once the, the new um, uh, facility is done for the next academic year, uh, that we'll probably immediately start work and build another one. I think that the demand at IEPUI for student residential housing is, is uh, huge. When I came in, we had a billion dollar uh, deferred maintenance bill. We've cut that in half, and we can see a plan clear to finishing all of the smaller parts by the bicentennial and subject to the um, state continuing to support us as they have very, very um, generously, uh, I see us getting all, pretty much all the major items done. We've, um, with our partners in IU Health, we'll be building a new hospital on the Bloomington campus. That's in planning at the moment. And we'll be um, uh, building an even larger hospital in Indianapolis, a uh, billion dollar plus facility uh, in Indianapolis. We got a program in engineering approved for the, for the Bloomington campus, um, hence making this campus the last campus in the AAU to get an engineering program. But we have one. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then the, the, the investment we've made in the arts and humanities, um, uh, the new cinema, which hopefully all of you are devotees of, which um, Meryl Streep said when she was here is the best uh, university cinema she's seen anywhere in the country when we did a retrospective of her movies uh, too and the, the new global and international studies building. We've tried to, for every new um, school or academic program we've started, we've tried to um, build new facilities. So for example, philanthropy in Indianapolis has moved into the new university hall which we opened a couple of um, weeks ago. I think I've done a groundbreaking or dedication every every week for the last six weeks or something like that, which is, I guess, a good problem to have, too. So I think all of this is really fundamentally changing the character of the institution. Every regional campus has had, a, has, has had or has underway a significant um, renovation or enhancement or expansion of, of those facilities. Friday, I go to Evansville to um, open the, um, sorry, do the groundbreaking for the new um, a medical education center, which involves University of Evansville and uh, USI uh, uh, down there, which is going to significantly expand our, our presence in, um, in, in, in Evansville. Uh, and all of that, I think, just, just points towards a... Um, oh, and of course, we did this morning the, the formal opening of MDPI, which is one, but only one, probably the most visible and the largest, but only one of what will become a series of what I think of as heritage and, and, and history preservation projects for the institution, which will culminate in the bicentennial as well. So, so I mean, that seems to me to be changed by anybody's definition <laughs> of change. Well, also, uh, the replacement of Tamarack Hall with the partnered building yes. with, IU, yes. with that's Ivy under, Tech. That's, that's underway, yeah. Yeah, uh, at IU Northwest, major renovations right. at Kokomo uh, right. will be finishing up in the not too distant future. So, I hope. Uh, you know, people really, you know, grasp that IU is on the move. So the Bicentennial Strategic Plan uh, came out just uh, at the end of last year, as I recall, endorsed by the 
trustees uh, it sets a number of aspirational goals for the university through 2020 and Michael could you talk a little bit about how IT professionals across all of the parts of UITS schools campuses uh, what should IT professionals be thinking about how they attach themselves and contribute to the bicentennial strategic plan well I, I probably probably sort of comment on, on some of that already but let, let me let, let me make some of the points um, Again, it's interesting, when I went through that list of uh, various new initiatives, uh, new schools and so on in the institution, a lot of, a lot of that change has been, has been driven by information technology. Um, the media school it was formed because the bright line that maybe once existed between the various units that, that were merged to form the media school really had ceased to exist. Telecom, and journalism, communication, and culture, and yeah. uh, film studies, uh, and the, the 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 students were uh, had had seen this, and those units, I think, were uh, started to be concerned at remaining attractive to students um, uh, when they when they were probably seen as not providing the kinds of education that the modern media world wanted. Um, it, that, it's interesting, you talk to just about anybody in the media world and, and we, we are applauded. I was talking to my colleague, the Chancellor at Berkeley, a few weeks ago, we were at a function at New York Times together, and he said, oh, we really like what you've done with your media school, we're looking at doing something similar. So I think that's a nice thing when Berkeley is, is watching what we're doing and, uh, and following it. But, but when we talked about it, it's for the same kinds of reasons, those distinctions no longer exist. What was one of the key motivating arguments behind putting engineering in place? Information technology has um, made engineering really a pervasive discipline throughout the sciences. You can't draw those clear, bright lines anymore. And uh, the new School of Art and Design, the most recent school that was approved by the board a few um, weeks ago, uh, actually in this very room, um, the that was, a, that was formed in part because of a realization uh, that all the different areas of design where there was once such a bright line, as I said, between them, all that broken down with IT. Once you can digitize anything, um, then you can mix and match and integrate anything. Uh, so I think the, 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 the continuing evolution of the university in just about any discipline is, is absolutely fundamentally uh, reliant on having, an uh, having on information technology. And to be good at that, it has to be an outstanding information technology infrastructure, both in terms of the services and the, and the actual infrastructure it, itself. Michael, the uh, illustration here, in case you missed the uh, digital fashion show on uh, Monday, yeah, right. Monday evening, uh, students from uh, the fashion merchandising uh, program and in the School of Art and Design, there was a tech fashion show right. on uh, Monday right. night as right. uh, part of this. It's a perfect example of the point, Brad. Yeah. Yeah, we'll hope the batteries hold up on some of those uh, uh, garments. Uh, the other thing that. Uh, battery uh, life is getting better all the time. Yeah, battery yeah. life is getting better all of the time. I, I saw Google has. Uh, uh, patented something uh, recently where the, the, the entirety of the fabric itself is um, a, a touch screen is sensitive. I mean, the, the fabric, the wearable fabric, it's not something you put on your wrist or something, you know, it's actually what you are wearing. That concerns me greatly uh, <laughs> wh wh where, wh where, where that may be going, but, but we'll see. Uh, just, uh, I believe, three weeks ago, uh, the president kicked off the, uh, for all, the Bicentennial Capital Campaign. You want to tell them briefly about that? Yeah, well, um, uh, uh, philanthropy is, is a, I think as all of you understand, is, is just a, a, a critical part of higher education in the United States. Um, as I've said many times, and I prof profess to be in a better position than most since I've come from somewhere else, uh, it, it, it is the kind of secret ingredient that makes the system of higher education here the, the, the best in the world. Private philanthropy is what enables universities to do things um, in this country that they simply can't do uh, in other parts of the, of the world. It's, not, it's just no surprise that, that all the innovation 
um, that happens in higher education happens here. There's rarely anything internationally that, that happens that really is innovative occasionally. Um, the, the flow of ideas is, is pretty much one way in higher education. And then you look at where it came from, more often than not, it's because it's something that's been funded at least in part with uh, either philanthropic money or money through um, uh, one of the great funding agencies uh, too. So uh, we, we decided after having finished, um, under my presidency, finished uh, two campaigns, first the one for Bloomington, which exceeded its goal, uh, well, its initial goal by, by over $100 million, and then the second one for Indianapolis, which came in at just on $1.4 billion, uh, that, that we would view those two as the first half of a $5 billion campaign to terminate in the, in the bicentennial. And, and so when we, when, we, when we developed this in the silent phase, which was um, uh, some years ago now, uh, we, we decided that for the first time ever, we wanted to have a true uh, all-campus, university-wide campaign. Everybody would be involved, every campus, every school, every unit in the institution, and we would, we would see ourselves as one institution while at the same time um, honouring the uniqueness of the individual components of the, of the university. Um, and that we would go for a real, as they say, stretch goal. And that, of course, is the 2.5 billion, which we have set as a target by the 31st of um, December um, 2019. And then, of course, those of you who follow this is the bicentennial is 20 days later on the 20th of January uh, 2020, though the whole of that academic year will be the bicentennial celebration year. So we had a, a wonderful event announced um, uh, a surprise gift from David Jacobs of $20 million uh, on top of what his family has already contributed to the Jacobs School of Music. Um, and then um, we, we announced uh, some further, uh, further gifts, uh, one from Conrad Previs, one of the school of uh, the Kelly School's uh, alums who was here just on the, on the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was another $20 million gift from Conrad and then um, uh, of course, that was on top of the eight million from Fred Luddy for the new building that you'll be responsible for now for a, for a period. <laughs> Luddy getting, Hall, Luddy getting Hall, it, getting it built. <laughs> and, and, um, and Luddy Hall, as it is as now known. So, uh, and we were able to announce that we were just roughly at the halfway mark. But, um, but it is, it is. We we hope that we've put in place incentives for uh, all faculty, all staff in the university to be able to contribute to that campaign through a matching program. Um, and uh, we've, we've announced the priorities, um, undergraduate fellowships, study abroad fellowships, graduate fellowships, named uh, professorships and chairs, and, and also a general focus on the health and well-being of the people of Indiana, too. So that's underway. Uh, hope, if you're not wearing your badge, hopefully you'll get one soon. Um, yeah. that's, the, that's the campaign badge Brad and I are wearing. Uh, absolutely, and I hope you, you heard what uh, the president said, a $2.5 billion goal by 2020 with about $1.3 billion of it in are already. So just an extraordinary effort by the IU Foundation and the many friends of Indiana University across all campuses. And I'm going to take a personal moment to comment. Uh, as an undergrad kid in Oklahoma, I had the opportunity my senior year to have a brief study abroad experience. It was a short-term arrangement, but it just really opened my mind so much to you just go live in another country for a while. Uh, you could argue growing up in a small town, rural Oklahoma, I could travel to any other state and it would be like another country. <laughs> but, uh, you know, actually living and getting around on public transportation and things, you just learn so much in doing that. And it is one of the president's priorities is continuing to enable more and more of our students uh, to be able to have some sort of international experience, whether it's a year, a semester, uh, you know, a few weeks, a uh, summer, to have some of those experiences. And uh, all of the president's cabinet uh, are committing to the capital campaign. And I want to share that 
Uh, I'm endowing a scholarship for a student to have an international experience that is open to a qualified student from any campus of Indiana University. So I think this is a really important thing for us all to be involved with. So Michael, maybe the last topic. Uh, you mentioned 300 million recently for Grand Challenges. That's kind of an eye-popping number. So uh, what's the process for Grand Challenges under uh, Vice President Kate, and what happens next as we move forward on these frontiers? Well, just, just firstly, Brad, just a comment about the, the amount. Um, we, the total budget of the university is about 3.3 .3 billion, and, uh, and our partners in uh, IU Health um, have a budget that's even bigger. Um, about 5.5 .5 billion. Uh, and uh, as an institution, though, I think it's fair to say that we have um, maybe spread our internal research funding um, uh, a, a little more broadly and, um, and, and thinly uh, than maybe commensurate with the kind of impact that we would want to have. Uh, so um, uh, with working with the, the provost and um, uh, and Chancellor Pater, Vice President, uh, Executive Vice President Applegate, uh, Dean of the Medical School, and a number of other people. Um, we and, and and of course Vice President Kate, we uh, devised a program that would effectively aggregate resources from across all all um, our offices. Um, and my office in particular is is going to be involved in the funding of cross campus projects. So there's a premium on projects that straddle um, uh, both campuses. But we really want these projects to be on a scale that they'll have genuine impact. Um, frankly, uh, unless you really fluke it, you, you, you can't have impact with projects funded at a quarter of a million dollars. Um, uh, it, 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 there's, there's the chance of some you know, remarkable discovery somewhere, but it, but it rarely happens. But you can have an impact with a carefully chosen program in which you invest um, millions of dollars over a period of time and put together a critical mass both based on pre-existing people and also based on um, uh, additional hires as well. So this we expect is going to enable us to hire in the vicinity of another couple of hundred postdocs and also graduate students on top of that across the, the key areas. Now the process is um, we want this to be as transparent as possible and we, but we don't want to waste the time of faculty and others. So the, call, the initial call is a call for eight page proposals. And uh, those are, and we've, we've already heard of um, many people who are preparing these. That's due in um, November. And those, those eight page proposals uh, will then be assessed by both um, an academic committee and then there's a committee on which you sit. Uh, as well that, that will then choose somewhere in the range of, um, I'd say probably five to six, but we, we're even leaving that open, uh, proposals that we will then invite the, the further development of up to about a 40-page proposal, which will then include a more substantial budget, et cetera. Um, those then go through the same process. They're, they're due in uh, April sometime. They, they then go through a further process, and, they, and the final recommendations come to me in June. Uh, I expect that we will um, fund one or maybe two of these in the first year, and then each year leading up to the bicentennial, we will fund fund another one. So that's basically how how it will work. Um, but this this is something that a few other institutions out there have done, and they've done it for the same kinds of reasons to sort of try to aggregate resources to have a real impact. Stanford's done it through their um, actually partly as part of their campaign. They've used it as a me mechanism for their campaign. Princeton's done it, UCLA's done it. And uh, we certainly um, also got a lot of attention by, by announcing that we, would, we were gonna move in, in this direction to, to ensure that our research dollars really, really do have impact. Well, I think if you read the announcement about grand challenges or you go to the website about it, one of the things that's also really exciting is one of the conditions around these is that they are very high impact on society and the human condition. And so this is wanting to really tackle and deal with some challenges that we have in the state. Population health, obviously obesity, uh, 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 all kinds of disease, certain areas of clean water, understanding lots of things in, uh, with network sciences. And so just 
as you say, even the initial set of proposals and conversations that are spinning around are already connecting all kinds of things between de academic departments and bringing conversations together at a scale and leverage that just wasn't happening uh, before taking on and doing something like this. So, Michael, is there anything else that you'd like to share with this audience? We only get together in a big party uh, once a year, though. I'll say last night's might have been slightly even a better party uh, for those of you who are at the CIB for the Staff Appreciation event last night. Well, I, I, I will say one thing, and I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to embarrass uh, Diane Jung. Um, uh, the first of these conferences I went to in uh, 1997 uh, I think it was, it was in April or May, I've forgotten, uh, 1997, uh, might have been later. Diane gave a paper which was so, called something like, um, uh, Heroic Effort is Not a Sustainable Model. And I, when I saw her before, actually I asked her this every year, I said, have you retracted that paper yet? <laughs> <laughs> and she told me before, I know she's modifying it though, she's modifying it. Um, I, I, I have to say, uh, I look around, I see, uh, lots of people that I work with uh, when I was in your job, Brad, uh, and um, uh, and th they were uh, they were great and wonderful times, as I'm sure they are now in terms of what we were creating and doing together. And uh, looking around and seeing so many people I know and people I don't know uh, as well, um, I do want to thank you all collectively um, for what you did when I was in Brad's job, uh, what you have continued to do so so well and the wonderful contributions that all of you have made through your heroic efforts at Indiana University and, and for that we are, are deeply in all your debt. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. So, Michael, if you'll now join me, uh, thank, thank you for, to everyone. We've accomplished so much together over the last 20 years. Thank you to everyone for this. Now, We do have one final moment, and you may remain standing if you would like. This will just take a moment. Uh, we do have uh, an important tribute and a retirement to celebrate tonight, this afternoon, is after 14 years of glorious service, we are retiring one start today. <laughs> so with that, uh, I will give Eric the command, and he is going to reroute the, uh, the name so it resolves to a different location. And I just want to say a few words at this retirement. Um, one Star, you have served Indiana University with great dignity and fortitude for 14 years. You showed up every day, almost every hour, but every day. <laughs> For uh, 40 years of service, you stood with dignity when students took your name in vain, though the problem was with PeopleSoft, but they called it One Start, and it was not your fault in that particular moment. But you have shepherded us through countless billions, billions of digital transactions that enable the life of Indiana University and to all of the staff here who helped create one start from nothing, from the idea to create that here at IU, run it through 14 years of service, and now have replaced it with the extraordinary one.iu.edu that has already been licensed and is being used in esoteric places such as West Lafayette. Uh, we want to give our thanks and congratulations to all the staff who've worked on both projects. And One Start has now left the building. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we will see you next year at the statewide IT conference. Thank you, Michael.